then we will get going. Okay, uh, although I've managed to lose. There we go, I'm back. Okay, welcome everybody. Welcome everyone joining us. Uh, welcome to what I think is about our 48th uh, Reading Online Sport Economics Seminar. Uh, the more um, important uh, aspect of that is that it actually marks a full year that we've been doing this. So. Um, those of you that have been with us for the whole year, it's been great to have you. Those of you that have joined us along the way, it's been great to have you at each point as well. But March the 27th of last year, uh, just as the first wave was really starting to pick up, uh, pick up here in the UK and we'd locked down, we began meeting online each week to hear uh, top sport economics research being presented. For me, it's been an absolute highlight of my week the whole time. It's, uh, to some extent, it's almost... Uh, made up a little bit for the fact that we've had this pandemic uh, going on around us uh, and disrupting us for the entire last calendar year now. Uh, and so uh, for all those that have presented, thank you for presenting. Uh, for all those that are scheduled to present after Easter, uh, looking forward to that uh, too. Uh, today we have Ray Vamplu, I'm really pleased to say, uh, giving our final talk before Easter. Uh, Ray's uh, from the University of Edinburgh and the University of Stirling, and he's going to talk about the emergence of commercialisation in sport, or was it always there? Ray, you've got an hour in which to talk. Uh, please do uh, share your slides if you're able to, uh, and uh, take away your talk. Are we okay with that? Looks good. If you stick it on the presentation. Uh, da, 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 da. Yeah, from beginning. Yeah, yeah. Yep. There we go. Perfect. All right, am I on? I feel, as I've said before, when I was the last speaker of the seminar that James organised when we were there in the flesh, a bit like the man after following the Lord Mayor's show, an hour of other people, and I'm coming along to sweep up the muck now. Um, I think we can all agree that modern sport is awash with commercialisation. Indeed, that's the very reason that most of you have a job in sports economics. Um, broadcasting deals resemble telephone numbers. I think we should say maybe ISD telephone numbers these days. Professional players earn several million dollars, pounds or euros a year, even before image rights and endorsements are taken into consideration. In, ag in aggregate, amateur sportspersons like, like myself spend a fortune to participate in our chosen activities. And before COVID intervened, the global equipment and apparel market had been estimated to top $82 billion by the end of 23. So when did all this start? Well, sports historians generally accept that, quote, modern sport and commercial activity were certainly intertwined from the mid 19th century onwards. Mass gate money spectator sport became a success story with the formation of leagues worldwide and at the participation level, some sports goods manufacturers becoming global suppliers. But what of earlier time periods, of eras, of eras which have not been scrutinized so thoroughly by an academic discipline too focused on modern sport. Briefly, this paper will look at the historical development of commercialization associated with sport before the industrial age. My presentations, I say there, will give the reasons why I think the topic is worth looking at, propose a working definition for research purposes of what commercialization in sport is, I won't go into too much detail, detail about the historical evidence of commercialism in sport, but provide some historical hindsights of which you might not be aware, and I wasn't aware till I started this work. And propose a way of assessing the level of commercialization at points in time, and then discuss the limitations of what I've done so far. And what I would appreciate in particular are comments on two things. One, my working definitions of commercialism in sport, and secondly, my idea of the, measuring the levels of commercialization. 
Now, the backstory to this inquiry was my appointment as general editor for Bloomsbury of a six volume cultural history of sport. As general editor, I had to read everything that was going into the book and reading chapters on sport in classical Greece and Rome. In medieval times, sport during the Renaissance and in the Age of Enlightenment, Enlightenment none of them, I would stress, written by economic historians. These revealed scattered references to commercial activities associated with playing and watching sport. And this stimulated me to undertake a long period analysis using the output of reputable scholars to ascertain whether sports commercialization existed in any real sense in earlier times. Now, what I would point out is none of the scholars that I read saw any historical significance in their findings that commercialization was happening. They just report it as being uh, happening at the time they were writing about. Yet to sport historians, two things are significant. One is that it is, it is often argued in modern times that commercialization has changed the character of sport, usually in a negative sense, it is implied. And secondly, if sport has been a commercial good for a long time, a longer time than we believed, it may have implications for general economic history. Now, I stress that what I'm doing is not a piece of original research, but it's one that draws on the scholarship of others and at the moment from a limited range of sources. What I'm trying to do is make an original argument hopefully one that will be tested by researchers more competent than myself in pre-modern history. There has been little discussion on the origins of commercialism in sport. The major periodization debate in sport history has been around the concept of modernization advanced by Gutman, in which he postulated, as some of you will be aware, seven systematically related features which he sees as being inherent to modern sport. Secularism, equality, specialization, rationalization, bureaucratization, quantification, and the seventh one was the quest for records. Significantly for this paper, Gutman did not specifically label either commercialization or, professionali or professionalism as one of these seven structural characteristics. Though he asserted, uh, associated commercialization with modern sport in the Western world, and he identified professionalism as being associated with equality in a negative sense and specialization in a positive sense. Now searching for the existence of early sports commercialism necessitates an operational definition of the concept. And for the purposes of this paper, I considered sport to have had a commercial aspect if any of the following features. Sorry, I've just got a problem trying to get the next slide up. There we are. First, then, there had to be an element of commodification in which someone was willing to pay to play or pay to watch sport. I've suggested elsewhere that this occurs in three distinct areas. Player sport products, which embrace equipment, your tennis rackets, etc., costume, clubs, facilities, and coaching. All these I see then as distinct player products. Then you have spectator sports products covering the game itself and the venue where it was played. And thirdly, what I've labelled associated sports products, which are goods and services that have been allied with sport in some way, but that are not really necessary to the playing or watching of sport. Though, of course, they can heighten the enjoyment, as with catering and branded merchandise. So that's my first element then, first part of the definition, an element of commodification. Secondly, the employment of professional sports persons. Talented, talented performers paid to entertain an audience, act as vehicles for gamblers, compete for prize money, or earn fees from coaching 
less skilled athletes. And the third feature of commercialism that I see is the promotion of sports events to stimulate economic activity in a particular locality by attracting visitors to that area, along with the spending associated in constructing the facilities and putting on the show. Let's now look at some of the evidence. I'm only going to give a few highlights here, but I'll have much more documentation for a, for a fuller academic publication. My aim with this is to try and get it presented at the World Economic History Conference, which has been shifted to 2022 in Paris. And the series gets published by Edward Elgar in their New Horizons in the Economics of Sport. You may have seen, if I can just, if anybody can see this. These are the two that they brought out earlier, and they are getting thicker, so maybe more people are getting interested in the economic history of sport. So the first period to look at is what I've labelled the, the bread and circuses period. Commercialisation of spectator sport need not involve the selling of tickets. The thousands of spectators who flocked to the Colosseum in Rome in the first century of the Common Era to watch a day of gladiatorial combat were not paying for their pleasure. This day of thrills and deaths would have been funded by a patron, either someone seeking power in politics or priests uh, doing it for religious reasons. But whatever it is, the money was made available independent of the, the spectators themselves. But there were profit makers, and the profit makers in all this were the gladiatorial managers who ran establishments of fighters and hired them out to the promoters who were organizing the displays of combat. The hiring fee was between 10 and 20% of the gladiator's value, but the full cost had to be paid if the gladiator was killed or seriously wounded. And the gladiatorial managers insisted on sureties for this eventuality. And the financial de system developed of promoters using financial middlemen, who presumably for a fee, would offer credit facilities sufficient to cover such mishaps. The gladiators themselves were highly trained, skilled, professional sportsmen. With few exceptions, they were not free citizens, but rather condemned criminals, prisoners of war, slaves, or occasionally freeborn men who had sold themselves to pay debts. There was a career structure based on a system of ranking and how good you were with the type of weapon you choose to use. If successful, a tyro could work up four rank grades to become valued at 15,000 sesterces. And look at what this was worth in a second. As well as being housed and fed by the stable manager, win or lose, they were entitled to 20% of their hiring fee as a wage. They often obtained a share of any prize money that was awarded, and they could also receive presents from fans or gamblers, with, of course, the ultimate gift being their freedom. Now, I have to make some sweeping assumptions now. I conflate the gladiatorial experiences of 177 in the common era with wage information from about a century later. A middle rank gladiator earned perhaps 2,000 sesterces for about. Now, less gladiators were killed than has been commonly supposed. And when you think about it, the fact you've got to pay 100% of the gladiator's value rather than 20% makes a strong case for people putting their thumbs up in the contest rather than thumbs down to have the death. A few exceptional characters fought over 50 times, though most top rank gladiators participated in less than 20 combats. Taking, say, 20 as a norm, applying the highest hiring rate available, career earnings come to about 60,000 sesterces. Now, put this in perspective, this was just about two years wages for an unskilled labourer. 
which you might say a scant reward for risking life and limb, but sufficient perhaps to buy his freedom if that was an objective. But gladiators were not the first professional sportsmen about which we have detail. They had been preceded for one by the ancient Greeks. Now, all Greek elite sports performers, be they athletes, wrestlers or charioteers, were professional. Not in the sense of sport being their full time occupation on which they relied for income, but in that they competed for prizes, some of which could be very valuable. Using assumptions which, which minimise the value, such as the lowest price of oil and the highest wage rate around, <coughs> classical scholar David Young has calculated that the 100 amphoras of olive oil awarded to the victor in the foot race at the Panathenic Games in classical Greece equated to about 850 days wages of a skilled, not an unskilled, of a skilled craftsman of the time and could have bought half a dozen slaves, or possibly a house. Far better than being a gladiator and much less risky. Moreover, there were enough festivals available for freelance professionals to undertake tours in which they combined a number of local games with one of the more significant, the four big ones in Athens and Delphi, etc. And these events could be highly lucrative. Some cities even paid appearance money to attract star performers to their festivals and evidence indicates that both individuals and especially the city states would sponsor <coughs> or subsidize talented athletes and in the case of the more successful who brought renown to their city offer public pensions after they retired from competitive sport. Additionally, so keen were some of these city states to gain victories that they persuaded star performers to change their citizenship with offers too good to refuse except by the most loyal. Roman chari charioteers also changed allegiances when the money was right. And it was in Roman times that chariot racing became systematically professionalized. Staging the chariot races was the responsibility of four racing teams, factions identified by their racing colours, blue, green, red or white. They began as independent contractors, but later became controlled by the emperor himself in the later years of the empire. From the faction leader and team manager down to the charioteers, the apprentices, the vets, the farriers, the grooms, the cobblers and more, the factions were self-contained entities that dealt with every aspect of preparing a team of horses for the track. They procured the horses, maintained the stables, trained the drivers and provided the chariots. The charioteers were almost exclusively low born, but as with the gladiators, those who were slaves could earn their freedom by their success as performers. And all drivers who survived the dangers of the racetrack could do well financially out of the prize money that they won. The prime example here was the Spanish charioteer Diocles, who raced for 24 years, won 1,462 of his 4,257 races, about a third, and accumulated over 35 million sesterces. The costs of putting on a race meeting were huge. A modern flat race meeting at, say, Newmarket might require perhaps 100 horses. The number of horses required for a single day of racing in the Roman Empire was somewhere between 576 and 1,152, depending on the nature of the races, how many horses were pulling the chariot, etc. This can be put in perspective by noting that a single racehorse might cost around, uh, as in Greek times, 1,200 drachmas, which was sufficient to buy nearly 10,000 days of unskilled labour or a flock of 1,000 sheep. You might say it's a real example of conspicuous consumption being a chariot horse owner in classical times. We move forward into the 
Byzantine era, the emperors dropped the Roman gladiatorial contests. They dropped the brutal animal sports, but they continued the tradition, uh, the tradition of chariot racing. Indeed, one of the first projects that Emperor Constantine undertook was to finish the construction of the Great Hippodrome in Constantinople, the largest building in the city. It was capable of seating over 100,000 spectators. Later emperors saw political wisdom in defraying the operating costs of this stadium and over 50 others throughout the empire. <coughs> Excuse me. Expenses which included the salaries of the charioted Years, their assignment and reassignment to the various faction, the training of horses, the construction of chariots, interval entertainment and feeding the crowd. The entire sport became virtually a government enterprise. Right, let's move on then in time and place. Medieval Europe. The medieval period is a darkish one in terms of information for sports historians. But we do know that two groups of professional sportsmen developed, tourney in knights and skills tutors. One of the most prevalent images of medieval sport is the knight in armor on horseback, ready to engage in jousting. But knights also took part in mock, ba uh, mock battles, called melees and tournaments, in which horses, equipment and men could be captured and helped for ransom by the winning side. Some of these events were large spectacles, but at Lungnisuman in 1179 had 10,000 participants, not 10,000 spectators, 10,000 participants, some 3,000 knights and their retinues and the rest fighting mercenaries. Knights themselves were mercenary soldiers, so the tournaments enabled them to hone their martial skills when not engaged in actual warfare, with, of course, the added bonus of making material gains. <coughs> By the early 14th century, the tournament was a well-established sporting fixture in virtually every corner of, a Euro of Europe. And one estimate is that a knight could tourney once a fortnight or so. In 14th century Europe, knightly tournaments became widely publicised and often lavish spectacles with spectators attending specifically for the show and some of them travelling considerable distances to attend. In 1389, there was a month long tournament in France which tempted a significant number of Englishmen to cross the channel solely for the purpose of watching the event. In many other cases, the number of spectators necessitated the erection of grandstands and the fencing off of areas to accommodate them. By the mid 15th century, short term sports tourism was a common phenomenon in Europe and towns offered to provide horses, a banquet for the participants and organizers in order to gain the profit derived from visitors. Stress, no one paid to watch the tournaments but towns vied, vied to host them because of the associated consumer spending of thousands of spectators who flocked to see the tourney in nights. And others, of course, took advantage of the commercial opportunities, including <coughs> vendors of a large variety of merchandise, livestock sellers, horse traders, land agents, money changers, freelance blacksmiths, bone setters, pickpockets and prostitutes. And a similar collection of such petty entrepreneurs can be found at the ancient Greek games as well. In the meantime, another set of professionals had emerged, those who taught skills to private clients. Admittedly, senior gladiators had acted as instructors to beginners, but this had been an in-house service obligation. Now, some of these new tutors taught non-utilitarian skills in tennis-like ball games such as the salaried residential professionals in the Italian princely courts in the late 15th century onwards. There were also freelance tennis players who provided a, backing, a betting market for their backers and onlookers. Others were involved in teaching martial skills and there are records of professional fencing masters in France as early as the 13th century. So what I've tried to show so far is that there was 
certainly some, we don't know how much, of course, some commercialization associated with sport in antiquity and in the medieval period. We move on then to the Enlightenment, roughly 1650 to 1800, the period in which science and rationality began to be applied more to life. And it's also now generally accepted by sports historians as the era which laid the foundations for modern sport. You probably all bought stiff now with all this ancient history, so let me just identify a few basic points. Historians have identified several driving forces across Europe that would have consequences for commercialism in sport. Gambling, much of the wagering that takes place seems to have been an aspect of conspicuous consumption associated with sport. Wagering to demonstrate that you could afford to lose rather than the basis of the economic sector which gambling was to become in modern, in modern times. Sports clubs right through Europe, fencing, archery, rifle shoot, later rifle shooting, they were a sports product in their own right. You got promotion of sport by the alcohol, alcohol industry. Uh, there's a lot being written on the British pub and alcohol, but right through Europe, this is happening. <coughs> Urbanization created larger markets. By the early 18th century, there were specific pay to view sports events in the London amphitheatres which featured commercial displays of sword fighting, staff fighting and cudgel fighting. And urbanization also contributed to commercialization as being paid in cash rather than agricultural produce or accommodation. Being paid in cash came sooner in urban areas and this provided the wherewithal and mechanism for paying admission charges. And finally, the development of the, the sporting media. I've always said the racing calendar has been going for 300 years now, which is the longest continuous sporting publication in the world. So what am I going to do with all this? This is where I need your help. This paper has not been concerned with the modernization of sport, except that modernization usually embraced greater commercialization be more concerned with whether sport exhibited aspects of commercialization as I defined it earlier before modern sport existed or to put it another way commercialization in sport did not infer modernization of sport. Now though some researchers would shift the beginnings of modernization back to the early modern period but perhaps even to the enlightenment None have claimed that ancient Greece, Rome, or even medieval Europe was its birthplace. Yet clearly, he says with a question mark, the games and tournaments of those times were associated both with commercialism and professionalism. So briefly, we have I think I've lost the slide somewhere. I've lost a slide, so you have to manage about it. Basically, briefly, we have uh, professional athletes in ancient Greece with large audiences drawn from all over the Greek diaspora. We have professional gladiators and chariot drivers in ancient Rome, along with huge sports crowds at the Colosseum and Circus Maximus. We have state-run horse racing in Byzantium. We have a tournament circuit where professional knights could tourney in medieval Europe. And jumping to the age of enlightenment, in addition to many traditional so sources of patronage, we have gamblers, innkeepers, and sports clubs all promoting sport. What I want to ask is can this be taken a stage further? Can we identify some sort of historical model of sporting commercialization within a country? And that's the unsophisticated version of it. 
Are there going to be four levels? No commercial activity, low levels, moderate levels, and high levels. Will you note I deliberately use the word level rather than stages? Because stages infers a series of steps of progression, whereas I see commercialization as something existing at a point in time with no necessary links chronologically forwards or backwards. Any historical slice, any historical cross slice can stand alone to demonstrate commercialism in sport or the lack of it. But how is it to be demonstrated? Elsewhere, I have argued that quantification is essential to subst substantiate any statements. And here we run into the limitations of current historical research, including my own. I have relied on the secondary sources of others, and at times may have committed the cardinal academic sin of arguing from a limited number of examples. I haven't yet traced examples of all the aspects of commercialism for each era. They may or they may not exist. Researchers haven't yet come across them, or perhaps they haven't looked for them. Sports historians have focused on the more modern eras in sport, leaving the earlier periods to historians more interested in non-sporting activities. Nevertheless, the amount of known commercial activity associated with sport in ancient Greece, Rome, and medieval or Renaissance Europe sets a minimum level. Further research can only push it up, not pull it down, not reduce it. However, such research might, it might also show even more non-commercialized activity, thus poten uh, potentially reducing the proportion of sport with commercial linkages within aggregate sport. A friend of mine, Mike Huggins, has recently argued in relation to the 1650s, let me quote, the proportion of commercialized sport to non-commercialized sport has certainly increased in the past two centuries. My question to Mike is, how on earth do you know this? Indeed, how can we know the proportion of commercialized sport at any point in time when historically we cannot establish the size of the sports industry? And this leads me to wonder whether a model for commercialism and sport might be more appropriate appropriately applied to individual sports within a country rather than a nation's sport as a whole. And possibly the, the same four levels can be, uh, be applied, but with a set of features, each of which infers some commercial activity being present. And again, this is something I would appreciate comment on. There's two slides on this as a full list of, of things. Like are there sports clubs where you have to pay fees or subscriptions? Have you got commercially produced sports equipment? As I suggest there, it may be one big difference between earlier times and modern times is that sports, most sports equipment might have been made by the participants themselves rather than commercially produced. Have you got commercially produced sports costumes? Are for sports facilities there which have to be rented for use or owned by a club? Do you have paid sports coaches? Do you have professional sports people? Do you have paid admission by some spectators? Sorry, I've just lost. I don't know what's gone wrong here. I'll just go down and press a button. I think if you if you do uh, from current slide, slide at the top. top. Yeah, got it. Anyway, sorry about that. So first you might get to paid admission for specific things like a better view or being on display to the crowd as you got, got in Rome. Or you might get general paid admission. Do fee admittance events become more regularly scheduled? And what is regular? Is it once a month, once a week? There was a major change that comes, the coming of more regular events. A lot of sport in the old, especially medieval times and Renaissance times, was an annual event and spectators saved up for it. it 
maybe happened in the post-harvest period. Is sport associated with organised gambling? Is sport associated with organised advertising? Is sport associated with the provision of food and alcohol which had to be paid for? And have you got sports uh, promotion of sports events, particularly to stimulate economic activity? If you used all these and any more things I can work on, that might say, well, a high level needs 12 of these, a medium level needs six, a low level needs, needs three. I just don't know at the moment. It's, it's all worrying around in my head. Um, should you have any weighting given to any of, of these points? Does organised gambling gain three points and general paid admission get two points? Don't, this is all up for grabs as I start working on this project. Now, sports historians have been in a similar position regarding modernisation in sport in ancient Greece and Rome. Gutman accepted that five of his seven criteria fitted sport in antiquity though not quantification or the quest for records. But he's unwilling to describe the era as approaching modernization, even though it's five out of seven. His theory is one of all or nothing. This is because he believed that the seven factors are systematically interrelated and all had to be present before modernization could be proclaimed. Moreover, most of the things he saw as modern uh, were there in antiquity had disappeared by medieval times. So what we might call partial modernization was not enough to kick on into full modernization. Now, my argument is none of this applies to an application of a model of commercialization. As far as can be ascertained, sufficient facets of the model that identify commercialism in sport were there in antiquity and were still there in medieval Europe, though and this, this is important. They then existed in a different form as sport itself had changed. The Roman monares had been replaced by tournaments. Gladiators had given way to knights, etc., etc. Whether there were any continuations or adaption of older ideas in other transition stages needs further research. But each era determines its own scenario. Brackets, with the caveat, that people at the time may not have been fully aware that they're involved in a new period. These labels are put on by historians afterwards. The Romans had continued to hold the Olympics and other Greek games in what had become part of their own empire. Byzantium dropped gladiatorial combat but retained chariot racing. The Ottomans later switched from chariot racing to long distance endurance events. Indeed, just considering that one sport of horse racing, there were several successive versions involved. In ancient Greece, private individuals bore the expense of ownership in both horse and chariot racing. <coughs> Professional racing stables became prominent at the Roman circuses. In Byzantium, chariot racing was state owned. In post Byzantium, in Istanbul, long distance endurance events were favoured before track based flat racing was introduced in the 1720s. Looking at the European cities, the urban paleo races in Italian Renaissance were patronised by princes, nobles, and townspeople, but that was later taken over by urban neighbourhood associations. There were similar uh, races in Germany, the, the Schalak races. Uh, the Palio and Shalak both had valuable pieces of cloth of prizes, but they differed. The Italian ones were inner cities affairs, mostly held on religious fete days, while those in Germany took place on suburban racetracks, coincident with local trade fairs. Come to the 18th century, European aristocrats and gentry saw horse sport as involving horsemanship and equestrian elegance, not racing. But you go across the channel, what do you get in Britain? You get a focus on speed, professional jockeys and association with gambling, favor, uh, unlikely 
European nobility. Sport had changed. Sport continued to change. There was no necessary continuity, continuity, no need to borrow ideas from earlier periods. But this does not matter to my argument. The concept of commercialization in sport does not require a continuum, merely existence of the elements of the model I'm proposing. Moreover, unlike Gutman, I'm not arguing for any necessarily interrelationship between the elements. For them just to be present is sufficient for my purposes. Thank you. Thank you, Ray. We have plenty of time now for the uh, interaction that I think Ray's holding from many of us. Uh, so please do feel free to raise your hands. Add comments in the chat uh, and uh, and uh, make your questions and comments. I can see a hand already. Ah. I can't tell who it is though. Whoever's got your hand up, if you want to uh, unmute yourself. Oh, Stefan. I think there that's, you go. that's me, James. Hi. <laughs> Hi Ray, um, Hi, uh, good to see you and the, uh, it's a really great topic and a really great subject and one that um, uh, I think it's great for economists to try to think about some of these things and try to see how that fits into their worldview in, in general. So um, I, I, there are a couple of things I'd, I'd, like to, I'd like to suggest to you about this. So um, th the first thing I think I, I, I want to say is that uh, I, if we want to say commercialism, and you 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 define it um, in, in with these terms commodification, employment, and promotion, but but one of the ways of thinking about this as well is that is there exchange of uh, of money, uh, and in that sense, you can say there's commercialization in not just in sport, but in all human activities from the invention of money onwards. So we know money, we think it's invented somewhere around 1000 BCE. Um, you, could, you could argue that there's commercialism throughout this period uh, from, from uh, you know, over these thousands of years. But, but I'm not sure that that's really what we think about when we talk about, um, when we want to distinguish the stages of economic development um, and particularly thinking of some kind of classification. And the, the, of course, the standard classification in economics is, you know, in, in terms of thinking about the sorts of activities you're describing here, is the rise of capitalism. And I think capitalism is, the, is, is I, I'd like, would like to argue to you that capitalism is actually a better word than commercialization. When does, when, when does sport become integrated into the capitalist system? And that really goes back, and I, in my view, it goes back right to the beginning of the capitalist system. So we think of capitalism as a uh, a system, uh, if we think of it in terms of a system of a market economy with um, private property um, and, the, and the use of the profit motive, that really gets going uh, in, in England in the 18th, at the beginning of the 18th century in a serious way, the withdrawal of the state from running the economy. And that's really also when we see the emergence of commercialism in sports. We see commercialism in sports in England in the 18th century, um, and and we see, and it and it and it spreads from there. So I, I I think again. So I so I argue that the better word that you're looking for in terms of this is is capitalism, not commercialism. Um, and then the, the the other the other thing I want to say is sort of more slightly parenthetical, which is to say it is to be a, a note of caution about talking about what the ancients did in relation to activities like gladiatorial contests and chariot races. Um, gladiatorial contests we think went on somewhere between 250 BCE and 400. Uh, AD, so something like a 650 year period. And our historical sources for this are a collection of Roman writers, maybe about 20 or so writers who in passing discuss uh, aspects of gladiatorial life. So people like the Pliny, um, Cicero, Cassius Dio, 
Um, there are a dozen or so others who are not who and there is no treatise on gladiatorial contests, no historical, nobody who says my subject matter is going to be how to explain to explain how gladiatorial contest works and so on. So if you think about um, making inferences about an activity that covers 650 years on which 20 people had written in passing, not as their main subject, you have to be a little bit cautious about saying how much we really know about such a thing. We know a little, but there's an awful lot we don't know. And that's the big difference, I think, between sport in the modern era and sports as we understand them in Rome, in Greece, in China or any other part of the world, is that we really know almost nothing about what actually happened. Um, and we rely on a, we place an awful lot of weight on a very small number of sources. Whereas in modern sports, we have endless information about what's going on. We know far more. And so we're much, we can be much more confident from a historical perspective about saying what was really going on. Uh, thanks, Devin. Uh, I take your general point uh, about capitalism. I'll, I'll, I'll follow that a bit more. As for the, the sources, I think they're getting a little better I mean, I, I had your views till I got involved in this uh, Bloomsbury project. There's a bit more coming out through people who are investigating legal cases, which happen to mention uh, particularly gambling cases involved. There is, but I, generally, yeah, 650 years and a few sources is, is sort of one source every 50 years. And some of those were written 30 years after or 50 years after. So it, it, it is a very dicey area. And I've got to do a lot more. Uh, reading around the topic to, to a lot more classical scholars, I think, than I've done at the moment. Okay, thanks, Ray. Thanks, Stefan. Roger's got a comment in the chat where he says, uh, from this analysis, it would seem that the amateur era in, in the UK, 1850 to 1900, is the blip and not an anomaly rather than the bedrock of sports development as we often consider it. Maybe for the Victorian elite not needing to be paid was a display of elitism. Uh, yeah, the interesting David Young's work shows the Romans did not have a word for amateur. The word did not exist. Uh, and the idea about, uh, get the phrase now, men's honor in corporate son, uh, was said by Juvenal, the Roman guy. It wasn't wasn't a Greek thing at all, and that was picked up by the Liverpool Athletic Association in the 1860s and became their almost their mission statement and their motto. Uh, so amateurism was not reinvented by the Victorians; it was invented by the Victorians. Thanks, Ray. Uh, thanks, Roger. Uh, when Roger, if you want to follow that up, uh, feel free. Uh, Matt has also put in the chat, isn't one of the big changes, uh, big changes to how modern sports spread and became more commercial across the world from the slightly later period is is when from the mid 19th century, you get rapid changes in technology in different areas, things like telegrams, telegraphs, radio, printing press and so on. Yeah, I think that's uh, that's a very valid point. Uh, but there's a there's a lot more communication around advertising sport, talking about sport in the Enlightenment period than I ever thought existed. It wasn't the old sandwich board men, you know. They were uh, newspaper. I think what happens we've concentrated too much on the British situation and ignore what was happening in Europe, and then. Trans said, well, this happened in Britain. It must be. It must be the truth. <laughs> and a lot of uh, there's now an idea that maybe there's seven or eight different models of sporting development occur throughout the world, and the British model was just one of these. And so the communications, yes, but it didn't necessarily have to be the modern communications of telegraph, etc. There was plenty going on. Uh, I think in a way, what it is, it's almost this. Uh, you get an area and they've got communication what communication with the next area and they've got communication. What the modern period does was jump over everything and give you much more long distance communications. Mm. 
Thanks, Ray. And, um, and Mark, Ian had his hand up, and then Stefan. Hi, Ray. So uh, my thought was uh, to do with the commercialization or the monetization of sport. And the thing that I think that has taken it to the stratosphere is the ability of uh, sporting authorities to be able to uh, advertise or to allow advertising, sell their product to advertisers. Uh, so that combined with technology to do it, obviously. But I was wondering in ancient times, I say I only know what Google tells me, but <laughs> I understand that uh, that, yeah, they have found archaeological evidence of advertising messages back in ancient times from uh, Pompeii and things like that. Uh, so I was wondering if there was any evidence that advertising was linked to sport back in those ancient times. I haven't had... found anything except in the sense of the the owners of the horses or the people who train the athletes advertising themselves by virtue of uh, erecting monuments to their successes. Yeah. So it's, it's more uh, advertising my ability as a, as a sports trainer. My I'm a great person because God has looked on me so favourably. He let my horse win the Olympic title. This sort of thing. Yeah. But, uh, I haven't personally found anything which says buy our olive oil. It's what we sm what we smear the victors with. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. <laughs> Okay, thanks, Ian. Uh, Stefan. Yeah, I, and 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 just to add to that, I mean, to to a large extent, I mean, we know that many of the games in Rome were set up as uh, were political vehicles. So, um, if you wanted to establish your credibility as a politician in Rome, you laid on uh, a, a lavish games uh, in order to attract support. So, in in that sense, there was there was more a political motive behind the games than a, than an economic one. Um, but I, I also wanted to, to 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 make the point, and it, following on from what you were saying, Ray, about these different models of sport emerging in different parts uh, of the world, um, not just a British model. I think that's I think that's a very important point. And I think, in particular, I think it's also it does actually relate in Europe at least to the way in which the the history of Greece and Rome was received, the idea of classical reception and the way it played out in the Enlightenment in Europe. So one thing that's often said is that in Britain, the, the British were very much focused on the Romans as their model, as their historical model. When in the Enlightenment, when the, the whole, the revival of interest in the classical period, the British with their empire modeled themselves on Rome and, and looked always to a, a, a Roman way of thinking of things. And that probably did, um, mean that an adaptation to the idea of gladiatorial contests and, and thinking in terms of way the Romans organized these sporting activities, which perhaps did involve some more commercial activity. Whereas, for example, the Germans were far more influenced by the Greek uh, classical tradition and were far more interested in the idea of Olympic ideals and less interested in those kind of gladiatorial horse racing, uh, chariot racing kind of ideas. Um, and you, and I think you see that in the way that Germany was far slower to develop a commercial interest in sports, and still to and 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 still to this day, I think re remains. If you think about the fifty plus one rule in in football, I think you can trace this German love of of the classical ideal of Greece rather than the classical idea of Rome. So, one thing that interests me in, in all this, Stefan, is. What was happening in Asia at this time? There's there's lots of evidence of independent sporting development taking place in certainly in China, about which we know very little. I I think that's right, and part of the problem with China is what little we know is mediated through the state apparatus, which is not entirely reliable. I mean, I think many people think that the Chinese archives, that you know, contain many secrets that that would be that would be of great interest. I I, I think you're right, but I and I think, but I, again, I go go back to the idea that in in the idea that the uh, a sporting uh, entertainment that could exist and there where wherever there's a money economy then there's going to be some kind of commercialism it seems to me that that's just 
that's just natural. It's to, but but again, we we from an economic perspective, we want to we distinguish the, the sort of capitalist system, and particularly the, the 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 profit motive as being something which is legitimate and can be pursued um, with and protected by private property. Um, where, which is perhaps what is missing in most economies in the pre-capitalist era, and even in in Asia in the early capitalist period. Yeah, um, one thing that's getting my interest at the moment is whether there were links between Greece and the Chinese Empire, the statues, the, the tomb, the warrior statues. They now believe that some of those seem to have the sort of sculpture that you would have expected from the Greeks rather than the, from the Chinese. And they've been looking at the road. Have you seen the documentaries about the roads that link the fringes of the Greek Empire with the major Chinese cities about whether something happened there? You know, maybe China wasn't totally independent of what was happening in classical Greece. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's the, no sporting evidence on, on that. Is no, there? and I mean, I, th those links are pretty tenuous. I mean, yeah. yeah, I mean, there's some there's some suggestion that Buddhist sculptures in Afghanistan were influenced by Greek sculpture, and perhaps some of Alexander's soldiers got left behind yeah. um, in the Indus Valley. But uh, it's pretty tenuous. I mean, you know, it, you you don't see archaeological evidence of large scale. I mean, for example, you'd find if there were really interactions, you'd see Greek coins found. In China and um, Chinese, um, you know, pottery goods found in ancient Greece, and there's none of that. So I think I I, th I think they were a lot. There were merchants who were moving between uh, Asia and Europe. There was a Silk Route, so we, we know that. But but I think the evidence for anything stronger than that is is a, is a little weak. Thanks. Thanks, Stefan. Any. Further questions or comments for Ray? I mean, I, I may have missed this um, when you were talking, Ray. I mean, I guess what kind of interests me, you know, you, you've got all these different areas where people have got together and exchange money or exchange something uh, to do things. I mean, is there some sense of what what the impetus is? Is it, is it all the you, know, you mentioned the conspicuous consumption? Um, but is it just the you know the need for to observe something, to see something, to do something? I mean, is there some kind of common link between all these different areas that you've been you know you've been talking about in terms of how this commercialism be it? at different levels developed at different points? I don't know. I mean, one idea that I have is, is a lot of it's to do simply with people wanting an identity. You know, in Rome, do you identify with the greens or do you identify with the blues? Uh, as with modern football, as with folk football, one side versus another. I mean, one thing about sport, it's usually got winners and losers, one side versus another, except for, you know, some environmental, but, but most sport, in, involves a contest, and people. I think that interests people, and they identify with with one aspect of it. But I, I think generally, there's there's all these things going on. Uh, I mean, Stefan's done a lot on on clubs and the role of the the club out with the state in in Britain and America, but ruled by the state in in Europe. But states were pro uh, sorry, clubs were promoting sport. Gamblers were promoting sport for their own own reasons. Petty entrepreneurs were, publicans were promoting sport uh, for their own reasons. But it's the people who were buying or consuming the product that we're interested in. And as you said, why were they doing this? The answer is we don't know. We haven't got the evidence. We have to make reasoned guesses, hopefully a bit, with a bit more evidence than Stefan was talking about with the tenuous links with Greece and China I, I mentioned. Or perhaps the gladiators as well, as you mentioned, what, 20 pieces of evidence for 650 years. Jorge. Well, everybody can have an early, early Easter. 
Okay, yeah, Hello. Right. Go, go ahead. I, I was wondering, you were saying something very interesting about kind of uh, medieval tourism to these uh, battles uh, that, uh, that happened with uh, 3,000 participants, 10,000 if I recall well. But my question is, is this, I mean, and you try to link this to the to some kind of, you know, this uh, sporting activity world, but is this very different from other activities at the time? Maybe religion movements, you know, when they were going in maybe in Easter or other type of fairs uh, that existed. Uh, maybe it's, it's just how society worked at the time and not really kind of something special about uh, the sporting event. Uh, that's kind of the question. Uh, it's an interesting question because I've always tried to compare the building of cathedrals with the building of race course grandstands. You know, they, they are the, some of the largest buildings around. Uh, but yes, I mean, that, that's a very good point. Um, but we do know that there were specific... Um, well, if we look at the Greek games, religion played a, part, a big part in those. And a lot of the peer, people that came were religious tourists others with a sporting interest, the others then they were sporting tourists with a religious interest. We just don't know the makeup at the moment. But that's a very good point. I think I'll try and follow that one through. Okay, thank you. Really interesting. Thanks, Roy. More questions and comments? I think while, while we wait, um, I quite like the, you know, you, you're thinking, uh, Ray, about the, you know, it's the, it's the people that consume it that are obviously most important in this, you know, that willingness to pay. We're willing to part sums for a Sky Sports subscription and that sustains what we see as the, you know, the sporting infrastructure at the moment. And I mean, I, I guess, you know, does, does your analysis offer us any kind of, an insight into into where that goes. You know, does it? You know, if it unwinds, you know, if we stop deciding we want to watch football as much and we want to watch a different sport, you know, how does that unwind? And have there been cases of sports? I mean, I'm, I think I'm aware from some of the economic history conferences I've attended in the past on sports history of um, pedestrianism. I believe this was a very popular sport a long time ago, and then fell out of favour. I mean, is it this the case that we have these fads and trends that are passing in in their nature? Yeah, it, is, it happens all the time. Uh, pedestrianism, of course, merged into amateur athletics and professional athletics uh, was just left to go its, its own way. Except you still had it going on in Scotland. The, the powder hole sprint, you have it in Australia with the stall gift, all been going on from the 1860s, 1870s onwards. But generally, professional ath athletics fell out of favour. Now, of course, all athletics is professional. <laughs> so it, it's back in. Uh, pugilism fell out, fell out, got civilized, became prize fighting, uh, became boxing with, with gloves. Mm. Cricket had to reinvent itself as, as a whiz bang, you know, twenty overs instead of five days. Uh, some sports have disappeared altogether, and this is particularly true with, with what we call traditional sports. They're they're fighting for revival, but they're not going to be commercialized to make them revive. They're just going to be exist in a very small scale with local uh, uh, adherence to them um but yeah you can go back through sport we well, we don't have chariot racing we don't have we've got to uh, mix martial arts instead of gladiatorial combat um how how far before letting someone die in the ring is allowed yeah and i suppose the football that we know now is a very different game from the football that was played 100 years ago and the kind of folk football that you mentioned that it has its origins in as well, I guess. I mean, do you think that the, these all these sports essentially adapt because of commercialization, essentially? They adapt when their leaders adopt commercialization. I mean, you look at every national, uh, every international sporting governing body, they all set up with the, the tenets of, we're there for, to help develop the sport. Uh, so then they start taking, getting professionalized, commercialized, television contracts. And in the end, what was the means to the end becomes the end in itself. 
And that might cause a downfall. Eventually people will rebel against it. Yeah. I, I mean, I could jump in there. I mean, if that, I, again, it comes back to it seems to me the precondition for this sort of for, for, for commercialization is is capitalism in the sense that, again, as far as we know, the, the Roman games lasted for hundreds of years and were never really taken over in that sense. They never grew into that. The, the things you're talking about that's happened in our modern era didn't didn't seem to happen back then or, or certainly not on, a, on the scale that we see today. And so, again, it's it's as you say that these sports were founded by people with the intention to promote amateurism and participation, but they get hijacked by capitalists who then see an opportunity to turn this into profit and um, private gain. And, and that's that's the thing that seems to be missing when we look at the ancient sports or when we look at Asia. Um, there wasn't that there's not that dimension of of the ability to hijack for private gain. Um, and, and in case that sounds too negative, I mean, <laughs> To entertain people, right? I mean, actually, actually, does. I mean, the game it brings us entertainment, so it's not it's not a wholly negative uh, thing. Um, one of the few people that believes sport on TV is better than it ever was. So. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just I'm just pinching your idea there. So. <laughs> Okay, any final few questions and comments for Ray? Oh, there's, there has been some chats that I missed some of those things. So Roger said, uh, in determining the levels of commercialism in medieval European sport, is it feasible to estimate what proportion of the elite participated? Uh, was sport mentioned in um, Chaucer? I have butchered that. The, I think uh, better scholars than me can, <laughs> can talk about that. Uh, there is this, this lovely phrase that medieval period is where sport history went to die. Uh, there's no, the source material is so, so <laughs> patchy. Mm. Anna's just mentioned, would would it be interesting to look at the tipping point between promoting sport and being overcapitalized to the point of leaving it? Well, you'd say no, because you think sports evolved to its most um, perfect uh, point yet. I didn't say perfect, I said entertaining. <laughs> sport will never be perfect until Barnsley win the Premier League and Hibs win the Scottish Premiership. Who, who for the Scottish Premier League? Hibs, did you say? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now, one of these poor unfortunates uh, who, who got a mixed marriage. I married into a heart supporting family, and I'm a hit high you see. <laughs> <laughs> so, is there, is it possible for a sport to be overcapitalized? I mean, people are always talking now about VAR destroying the game in football and. Uh, other aspects of money destroying games and so on. Does it actually does it actually happen? Is that what has led to the is, downfall? Is the, is, would you say the uh, due to capitalism? There's always been a demand for precision in decisions, hasn't there? You know, teams in the Premier League saying, "Well, these decisions can cost us relegation and cost us hundreds of millions of pounds. We've got to get these things right." Who, I mean, I, I, really, I, I don't know who actually sanctioned VAR originally. Was it the teams or was it the Premier League itself? That's a good question. I mean, it, it was first used what in international tournaments and in Australia and MLS, I think. But I don't know whether that gives you anything about who were the driving forces behind it. Stefan might have more of an idea. Well, I, I mean, I think the, the, the pressures of VAR came from, you know, incidents like what the, the notorious um, non-English goal in the German game in what was in the 2010 World Cup. Lampard's goal, uh, yeah. Right. And so, I mean, in, 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 some, in some ways, I think what the way this is working is the, the, 
the 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 commercialism that creates the broadcasts creates the public opinion and then for the sports authorities feel they have to respond to that public opinion and that uh, through adopting these these the, the 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 new systems and so in some sense they, it is the, the 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 social pressure the commercial pressure that ultimately brings about the change in the game even if it's not from directly it, it, indirectly it's about making more money out of the game because you fear that you're going to lose supporters if you don't do something to address what the fans say is a problem that i think that's the mechanism i would see Overcapitalism, overcapitalized can also mean that the things are valued more than they should be in the market. So is, is, that, is it when some franchises get sold in American sports and they go down in value? Is it that the stage we can say it's overcapitalized? Yeah, I mean, I'm, yeah, I, I mean, as a, as a technical economic term, I think I'm not sure what, what overcapitalized, what, what sense it's being used in here. Um, as a, as a, as a, is it is this just a general complaint of too much capitalism, or is this a point about specifically some technical cap point about what will happen, um, some economic process? I'm not sure. I think Anna's tried to clarify. So she reckons she might have worded it poorly, but was thinking more about people being priced out of playing sport, than the impact that has on audiences watching it. Uh, if you're looking at eras and stages of capital of commercialism. And I wonder whether that factors in also people being priced out of observing it as well. I don't know. You, know, you have things like uh, the movement away from you know, things being quite some mass access when they're not on free to air television and things like that. Well, people are being priced out of specific activities, ways of viewing it. The, the, the opportunities to view have never been greater um, and the and the reach in terms of viewership has never been greater. I mean, it, it wouldn't, uh, you know, it, there's a sense in which you might, there's exclusivity in terms of, you know, getting into the stadium perhaps, but not in terms of uh, overall viewing. Um, although I think the cricket example is good. I mean, that that that's always, that's always the fascinating example, the decision to um, sell the broadcast rights to Sky um, and taking it off, um, uh, free-to-air television in the UK. That that obviously, um, and it's you know the, the jury is still out on whether that was really a good uh, decision in the long-term interests of, of English cricket. I think. Yeah, I think that's what I was thinking in terms of limiting access, um, and um, I've lost my train of thought. So I'm going to say that Sarah's put in the chat. Cricket's benefited uh, in terms of technology by being on Sky. I guess thinking back to our VAR discussion. Uh, Jorge's got his hand up and I'm aware I've kept him waiting a little while. Uh, yeah, thinking a bit about that idea of over, which is not very clear what it means, I guess, also over capitalism, over capitalization. Uh, I'm thinking about uh, football, uh, soccer. Uh, maybe when we compare, you know, uh, not amateurs, football, but even football before the 1960s, I guess, uh, with what we see today, it's just a matter of uh, commercialization has led us to a matter of inefficient allocation of assets. If you think in the 1950s, 40s, 20s, whatever, the best players were always on the field, uh, wherever they were, in South America or in Europe or in Africa or Asia. Uh, but nowadays, because of this, I would say, you know, following with the wording, overcapitalization, uh, uh, the best players are all in Europe, in five leagues, but they are not on the field. Uh, many great players from uh, many countries are on the bench. <laughs> and uh, so maybe that is something to think about over commercialization because of course that comes from you know the, the money in Europe comes from extreme commercialization of the sport and concentration and all this stuff. Uh, but you know thinking about what you guys were talking and what we're talking about today, maybe that is an effect, a long term effect of this idea that uh, we discussed today of, of commercialization in sport is 
maybe in, in, in football in particular is leading towards a bad uh, about road, a bad path, I think. Uh, that was my idea. <laughs> Thanks, Jorge. I mean, is that, is that not similar to a situation, say, with, with health professionals? Yeah. They I haven't been the able to, to become compare nurses with other Europe. type of professionals because health professionals, I don't know if they, you know, they, for example, from third world countries like Latin America, they, they tend to go to the United States where they are much better paid, but they work there. They are not on the bench. Uh, so I, uh, you know, I don't know if this is really s specifics to sports, maybe in a small, in a smaller sense to in basketball also, or even in baseball. Uh, but beyond sports, I, I don't see it clearly. There also isn't a national team in healthcare professionals either, which matters. You know, I guess the, you know, for Jorge, the Colombian national team matters uh, in a way. <laughs> in soccer, it'll never matter in, in healthcare, for better or worse. <laughs> I'm wondering, James, in this question of, of capitalism and sport, is it not true that because Capitalism has to change, has to innovate to survive. It can never be content with the status quo. And is that explain VAR and one day cricket and the big bash changing its rules every year, things like this? Well, I think with, with cricket, it's that, that's surely a response to de declining interest and therefore declining commercial viability. Mm. But I'm not convinced that soccer needed it. Yeah, it's doing doing perfectly fine without VAR, at least from the perspective of us being willing to watch it. I don't know about other sports. You know, obviously, this you know, the technology's there in tennis, which has changed things a little bit with challenges, and obviously with cricket. Uh, you know, with, again, you know, there's a different system where it's been brought in with challenges, and that's almost almost seems like. Well, I guess it must be some kind of a. We have to bring this game into the modern era. You know, reflect what we can do now with our technology. Um, I mean, I can see why in, in cricket you might say it was a response to commercial pressures, but I don't know. Maybe soccer's just a, a, a quite an unusual case, or maybe it is actually more tenuous than I'm giving it credit for. Maybe we might all uh, start to lose, start to have lost some interest. I mean, I guess a lot of the changes in in football have been more gradual, right? You know, I mean, you go back and think about football in the late 1980s, and you could pass back to the goalkeeper and the goalkeeper could pick it up and you'd have you know these kinds of pretty dull games and lots of goalless draws in the world cup in 1990 and so on and then a, lot, a whole lot of changes since then so substitute rule would be a big one i think i think ray's point is though is the right one is that the the, the nature of capitalism is it's this innovation machine you have you constant that there is this constant process of competition and innovation, and um, you need to keep innovating in order to in order to survive in, in in many ways. And and that I think is the difference between that and say again, if you think about the Roman games, they could they could survive seemingly almost the same as they were for 650 years without very much. Well, and uh, again, obviously we don't know that much about it, but but even so, it doesn't seem there was necessarily that much innovation, and that's presumably because. Um, uh, you, there wasn't an opportunity for a capitalist to step in and say, you know what, I can do this better, or I can do, I can do it grander, I can make it more interesting, I can bring VAR to the um, gladiatorial kill. Um, that would, uh, yeah, yeah. I, so I, th I, I do think that goes to the heart of it. Is this this process of innovation, which is ca characteristic of the capitalist system? Mm. So I, I like the use of technology in cricket and rugby to a point as usually it aids the right decisions being made. In football, I think it is the people using it stroke the way it is used rather than the technology that is the issue. Football is also more of a free flowing sport.
But you can also imagine an innovation in the future where some people say, right, we're going to start a league that doesn't have VAR. And, and you, you know, you could play, you could play both. I mean, that, that's also something that you get this, because that's the other characteristics of capitalism. You get this multiplication of entities. You get lots of, so we don't just have football, right? We have, we have 11 aside. We have the men's game. We have the women's game. We have seven aside. We have futsal. We have, you know, we have endless innovations around ways to create this competition again, which is again, very different from traditional, the way we, under, what we understand traditional sports to have been prior to the, the modern era. Um, it's, 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 uh, mm. there isn't, there yeah. isn't that. It, as a sports historian though, we can point out that the, the public schools objected to the penalty kick and split away from the FA for a while, didn't they? <laughs> and that wasn't a success. <laughs> <laughs> Well, on the topic of innovation, uh, I'm going to propose um, that we uh, that we wrap up uh, for now. Say thank you to everybody for a fantastic discussion. But what I want to propose is, that, is at four o'clock UK time, so in ten minutes' time, when this meeting properly finishes, gives us a little bit of time if we want to to to, to get a refreshment. Is and I appreciate this may be too early for some people, Stefan in particular, I can imagine, but some of those in Europe, in Europe I propose that we uh, return for uh, some kind of alcoholic. A refreshment and I'm personally going to have a very a very appropriate kind of refreshment which is I've got Corona uh, to uh, consume to mark a year of meeting because of coronavirus online uh, I will in the next few moments create an, a separate meeting uh, four o'clock uh, in the Roses team uh, so if you want to join us at four o'clock um, for end of the week end of the term uh, end of a year uh reminisce chat whatever uh please do that uh, but in the meantime thanks very much ray for a really uh, thought-provoking really interesting talk uh, and thank you everybody for your contributions as well and so i'll uh, wish you all a healthy and safe uh, weekend and easter break uh, should you be having one uh, and look forward to uh, seeing you again in a couple of weeks time if not at four o'clock in two weeks time we've got peter groot who's uh, presenting uh, on uh, american football so uh, either until four o'clock or until two weeks time. Uh, cheers. <laughs>